define something that is not possible to define. We have to stop engaging in discussions on who is journalist and who is not a journalist, or even try to define journalism nowadays. It's better for all of us to engage in a battle, a struggle to protect free speech and freedom of the media in the offline and online world. A new type of reporting called open or citizen journalism is emerging with the growing digitalization of our societies and the greater freedom it has brought. Small and big world news is published and debated in a seemingly never-ending stream of posts, tweets and comments on social networking and news websites. Information travels fast, faster than ever. Open journalism relies on user-generated content and encourages readers to contribute and shape the news-making process. I don't see any problem with this. Contrary to traditional journalism, open journalism is not about distributing the news story. Far from it. It captures the ongoing media development made possible by the Internet, in which editorial offices more frequently rely on users to provide them with information, give ideas and comments on stories even before they are published, and also assist in processing various documents. In many countries, unfortunately, also within the OEC region, there is a witch hunt going on against bloggers, social media activists, and journalists that are engaging online. This is something that is in the focus of my work and the focus on the work of many courageous NGOs around the world. We need to join forces and to do something in order to protect free speech and freedom of the media online. The time is right and the time is right to do this. The discussions are ongoing, organized in many parts of the world by many international organizations. It's something that is happening almost on a daily basis. But we need to do more. We need to do much more in order to protect people, no matter if we call them journalists or not journalists, in this fight for free speech on the Internet. Open journalism reflects the fact that the freedom to seek, share, and impart information and ideas no longer is reserved to the few, but to the increasingly many. We need to embrace this many. We need to work with this group of people that many call newcomers in this world of journalism. It is a powerful tool in exercising the fundamental rights of any democracy. Journalism in the 21st century has undergone a fundamental change from how it would be understood in the 19th or even 20th century audience. Open journalism is a tool we need to embrace in order to safeguard and to strengthen media freedom in the digital era. Because open journalism is not just the 21st century version of letters to the editors, it is much more than that. Open journalism has the potential of better meeting the needs of society and providing a plethora of pluralistic information. It also serves as an opportunity for an open discussion of the issues important to the public. Even though open journalism brings the wealth of new opportunities, it cannot replace traditional journalism. It cannot be used as a way of reducing the sources of news from traditional media and journalism. On the contrary, it must be seen as an important complement to traditional journalism, a way of strengthening existing media outlets and journalism as a whole. It can never weed out media pluralism. It must add to that and contribute to strengthening journalism altogether. That is why, once again, I think it is of a great importance that international organizations have a joint voice when it comes to defense of free speech and freedom of the media in offline and online world without any difference. Thank you very much, and I wish you a wonderful and fruitful discussion, hoping to be able to join you next year at IGF. Thank you. This was uh, Dunja Mijatovic, um, that is the responsible of the freedom of expression at the OSCE, uh, the Organization for 
so security and cooperation in in Europe. Um, she mentioned some words that I think that are perfectly fitting with um, the scope of this uh, of this meeting of today. Uh, she said that um, the people that work on the internet, creating journalism, are not newcomers, but have to be considered as that they cannot replace traditional sources of journalism, but they have to complement it and to um, give a, uh, to journalists by contribution, an important contribution to express and to reach um, the pluralism of voice in a different way. Uh, I think that this is the core of the discussion of today, that we try to, um, to see through different angles. We started from uh, something that uh, I don't know if you have already seen, but it's a, a book that has been published by uh, Reuters <coughs> Foundation, uh, made in association with the University of Oxford, written by Richard Sambrook. Uh, the title was quite provocative, is Our Foreign Correspondents Redundant? Uh, and uh, this gave us the um, idea to start from this point to see if the traditional uh, network of media in order to cover the world are still appropriate, if they, their reduction and their shrinking is a real problem for independence and for pluralism of voices. This is all about the discussion of today that will be seen by different angles. So I will start this with a very brief presentation that uh, you need to... to no, 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 no. The second is at the end. Now it's a presentation. So you need to. You need to. Okay. To plug here. Thank you. So this is a short synthesis of um, 250 pages that I try to condensate in four pages for your safety. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm not a digital native, as you can see. <laughs> so, the, um, this is the title of the study. The study was, uh, as first point, um, describing the declining importance of foreign news in the media. Uh, the data that are used in the study are mainly coming from Western countries. So, the first data concern uh, U.S. Uh, the U.S. space dedicated in the major TV networks program to international news has shrinked uh, between the 70s and the, and the 2000 uh, by 15%, uh, reducing to 20%. Uh, in the U.K., uh, now this declined in 2009, so the statistics for the U.K. are more recent than the U.S. declined to a record of 11% of total. And um, in some, kind of, in some television in the UK, this dropped even more dramatically. Uh, for instance, in ITV, in two years only, it dropped by 73%. Um, parallel to this uh, less attention in traditional media for international news, there is also a phenomenon of declining resources available for traditional media. Uh, the OECD study in 2010 um, reported that the newspapers are losing money and readers, they say readers, but it means money, of course, in 20 countries out of the 31 that, over, uh, that are members of the OECD. Uh, many countries are tackling these issues, uh, such France, Sweden, Netherlands, uh, introducing subsidies or media um, measures to support the press. Also, TV started to have less resources as a consequence of the decrease of the 208. Um, in the private sector mainly, but also in the, in the public uh, service broadcasting. Um, this as a consequence, as, an, uh, as a direct consequence, as a declining uh, number of foreign bureaus of traditional media. Um, in the 80s, uh, each of the major TV networks of the US has uh, at least 15 offices abroad. Today there are less than seven and none of these offices is in Africa, India, or South America. So there are big chunks of the world that are out of the sea 
uh, of the um, uh, US network. Um, the same phenomena happen for the uh, US newspapers that uh, reduced their network in three years only. Um, in seven years only, they have reduced one third the coverage of the world. And in Europe, we have the same trend, and even in some public broadcasters, this trend is happening. Uh, but the, the world is not only Western countries uh, and is not only media financed by uh, commercial revenues. Um, BBC, for instance, maintains still a network of 200 correspondents in the world, plus stringers and freelancers, mainly thanks to the World Service. Uh, Deutsche Welle and the National Public Radio of the US networks remain stable over the years. Some new international channels arrived on the scene, like France 24, in, that is the only one uh, recent in the Western countries. But there are many new networks that are expanding worldwide, uh, coming from other regions of the world that before were not actors in this scene, like Al Jazeera in Arabic and in English, Russia Today, CCTV and Xinhua from China. Uh, only to mention uh, that, uh, against the trend um, subject, the CCTV in the last three years opened more than 50 new bureaus worldwide. Of course, are bureaus that are totally different from the traditional bureau we, are, we were using in the past, where we have the, the chief correspondent, uh, a certain number of journalists, and uh, the producer, and then the technicians. The CCTV offices are made by one person, that is making the journalist at the same time the producer, at the same time the technician of himself. And they use not satellite, but they use FTP via the internet. So the, conclusion, the main conclusion of the study that um, I have to short to, to the most significant topics is that the crisis in journalism uh, network of sources seem to be mainly a Western phenomenon, uh, while in Asia there is a significant media expansion. Um, in Africa and other parts of the developing world, journalism, on the contrary, is developing um, on other bases. Uh, which are other bases? The, the study identified that social media are increasing, helping, helping countries develop a public space for debate, for the exchange of information, and to tell their own stories, while before they, were, uh, they have no possibility to make this. Also, on the other side, the social media are helping foreign correspondents report to those countries with greater insight and accuracy. But of course, they are not substitute for uh, the witness on the field. Okay, basically this were the, uh, the data contained in this study and this were the main conclusion. Uh, I don't want to um, create, to, um, to set up a conclusion for, from out of this, but this has, has to be just the starting point. So now I hand over to Jan that can give you the, the analysis with the situation from the Council of Europe. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, the analysis from the Council of Europe perspective is, uh, is not easy, so I won't even try to, 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 to do that. Um, the Council of Europe over the decades has been supporting uh, various aspects of, of journalism and media. It has been uh, supporting very uh, intensely pluralism, uh, of the media and in the media diversity of content um, in that context it has uh, set standards in respect in respect of issues such as transparency of media ownership it has uh, requested uh, our 47 member states to promote investigative journalism which is very closely linked to what we have been discussing uh, and hearing and, and of course the role of independent uh, journalists, uh, the, the, the role of independent media uh, with their own in editorial independence is essential and so on. In that context it has also promoted with the agreement of our 47 member states, uh, it is official 47 state policy, uh, it has been promoting and supporting public service media as an essential component of the media landscape. If you want to be able to ensure in the long run that there will be independent media and diverse media, 
you must have independent public service media in the in the media landscape. Now, how does that sit with the changes that have been brought about by the by the internet? In that respect, the the Committee of Ministers, the Council of Europe, the 47 member states have adopted two years ago a new notion of media, which changes the there hasn't really been a definition of media in the past. We knew what media was. It was newspapers, it was television, it was radio, it was magazines and so on. But what the, the Committee of Ministers, what the Council of Europe did was reconceptualize what media was in this new environment. And it said anything that projects content to mass communication is media. And it provided a set of indicators so that we can see what media is and consequences, indica indicative consequences of what should be done to that, what should be the approach. But the main approach is don't tamper with it. Don't try to regulate it. Regulation is something that is very dangerous uh, because it is very easy to interfere. And, uh, and uh, there, there may be certain aspects of regulation that are necessary, but be careful. Be very careful when you try to, to regulate. Now, we, that is the, the new media environment, the, 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 the social networks, the, the, the different platforms, the different content uh, providers, and so on. How does that sit with journalism? And how, how do we see that? If we see journalism, a long history, and I will simplify and probably get it wrong, but at the beginning, probably media was journalism. A journalist, someone who wanted to bring something to the public attention, set up his own journal and published and disseminated uh, a sheets of paper with, with information and so on. Later on, it became a business and it developed as facilitators. The media developed as facilitators of journalism. I think that afterwards, they became choreographers of journalism, of the process of developing the ideas, of getting out the news from wherever they were hidden and projecting them to the public uh, domain, to, the, to, the, to society. And in doing that, they little by little also became curators of the information. And they have trended, tended to become gatekeepers of content as well. Now, when we transfer that into the new environment, we may have seen a process in the new media environments that starts at the end of the evolution of the relation between journalism and media and that if the new players become gatekeepers of content, if they become the curators of content, that would be a matter for concern because the new players are relatively big and very often they are equivalent to uh, monopolies. And if we end up with a situation where there is no pluralism, no diversity, or even no freedom of expression, then we will simply not have democracy. So we have to, to think in those terms. Now let me come back to, to, to the question of journalism. Can professional journalism and the journalistic activity be replaced <coughs> by, uh, at least in part or, or, or largely, by the so-called citizen journalism? I don't believe that. I believe that there has to be some kind of uh, activity that embraces the values and principles of journalism in order to deliver to society what is necessary, the debate, the, the scrutiny, the challenge that is necessary in a democratic society. And I think that Dunia said it very nicely, that there won't be a replacement but a complementarity between open journalism and traditional uh, journalism. So I think that that is part of the, of the answer. The question is, 
if things are going to change in the media landscape, how do we construct the transition between the reality of today where we have seen that journalism is being supported less and less by legacy media and the future where journalism may be developed and deployed together with open journalism in a different form, in a different uh, sort of business model. How do we transition between the two in order not to lose out, in order not to uh, deprive society of the value of journalism in the interim? That is a question that I hope that you will be discussing uh, later. I will stop here, but I will uh, deliver a last uh, little message, a last little thought, uh, which links to something Giacomo said. Giacomo mentioned in, his, uh, in the slides uh, the BBC World Service. The BBC World Service has done a lot of good to the world. It was something that the UK, that the BBC gave the world. And it was very useful, it was very important in many countries, in many situations. Now, it is being scaled down. The business model is changing. And that is a pity. If we think in terms of public service media, world service was public service media delivered by the United Kingdom, by the BBC to the world. This thought came in the context of a debate, of a discussion, a couple of weeks ago on media in fragile states. And the idea that came up was maybe because of the value of the World Service, of the BBC World Service to the world, it may be necessary to find a different way of supporting the BBC World Service so that it can continue to thrive, to operate, to deliver the value of media and journalism, especially in fragile states, despite the downturn in the economy and the funding in the United Kingdom, perhaps it has to be funded differently, perhaps it has to be uh, the, the, the gift not of the United Kingdom but of Europe to the world, maybe it can be uh, funded differently even uh, in addition to Europe from abroad and so on and so forth. So, I leave you with that thought and I hope that at least I gave some uh, elements for the discussion that will come. Thank you. Thank you, Duru. If it was not an analysis, it's not far from that. Um, and I think that now we can um, move unless there are huge questions that you want to raise for this. There is one very huge question. I see that uh, somebody cannot resist to the intentional question. Uh, you can use this, waiting the, for the other one. Thank you. I'm, my name is Harry Surya. I'm a freelance uh, journalist. I was Knight International Journalism Fellow from ICFJ. Uh, I think it's a, a bit biased uh, developed countries in discussion. For example, in Indonesia there are 80 million internet users, including with mobiles. And uh, while 170 million people have no access to internet. What I'm doing with my fellowship in the last uh, two and a half years in Kalimantan, in Borneo, working with uh, Ruai TV, is a local television station, we set up a new communication channel using cell phones. Uh, we train already 300 uh, indigenous people and villages in remote area in the Borneo. And using from an SMS program, they're sending the news through SMS and with blasts to subscribers and also appear on the news ticker of the television and sometimes first over through the screen and we create some changes and I'm trying to get out of this uh, journalism box and uh, I see there's an opportunity to connect people who have no access to internet while they have access to cell phones 300 million 
numbers of cell phones been been bought by Indonesian and uh, most of the area covered by this uh, cell phone signal and uh, I call them not citizen journalists although they train on basic journalism I call them information brokers the role of the information brokers is not only to share what happened in their communities but also to find information, important information, for the communities. And it should be a media or other organizations, it can be NGOs or even government, to provide new communication channels that are independent and get, can be accessed by these uh, people who have no access before. This is a sharing and probably you have other ideas uh, of this uh, model of communication for grassroots, not for the meet-up class. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that is a useful contribution that anticipates uh, the next um, part of the debate. If uh, I can ask uh, Jan to go to... Do you want to say something that before? Y yes, uh, I'll, move, uh, I'll move out, but let me, let me just say that I agree entirely and, uh, and that the only way forward is to support that, and uh, and that is one of the of the elements in the in the puzzle. It is not the whole puzzle, though, but it is one very very important element in the puzzle. Perfect. So you got the first round part of answer. I invite you the, um, the, to join the next speakers that are. You want to come one by one so that the, oh no, you can come all together. Yes, of course, please. Yeah, oh. <coughs> we we'll open it somewhere. Yeah. Is it minimized at the bottom? 